Conventional wisdom suggests that the Earth is essentially a solid spherical mass, with an inner core of solid iron encased in a layer of molten iron, followed by stiffer mantle and the crust, before heading to the surface on which we all live. However, although this theory is almost universally accepted as absolute fact, it is only an educated guess, with no solid proof to back it up. The fact is that we have never been anywhere near to the center of the Earth. So with that in mind, theories that state the Earth is in fact hollow and even able to support life should be treated the same way as the widely accepted aforementioned theory. As you might suspect though, most scoff at this notion and dismiss it entirely without any further investigation. However, throughout history, many prominent and respected minds, thinkers, and even military veterans have presented detailed theories as to what lies deep within our planet. When these theories are combined with the numerous reports and texts that make reference to living beings and entire civilizations that live and sometimes come up from inside the Earth, not only appear to warrant further study, but when viewed with an unbiased mind, suggest there may be more evidence to support the Hollow Earth theory than not. It's very on exactly what the mass is, with some stating that it could be a magnetic core, while others suggest that it is a central sun. This is particularly interesting as modern science seems to suggest that the center of the Earth could indeed be as hot as our sun. In ancient times, Buddhists believed that the Earth was hollow and that it housed a race of supermen and women who would venture to the surface via tunnels. Buddhists even kept guards at the entrances to these tunnels to the inner Earth, said to be in Tibet. In other Tibetan, Indian and Hindu texts, an ancient kingdom called Shambhala is described, said to be located deep within Inner Asia, while other texts from India such as the Ramayana speak of the Avatar Rama, a great blue being from deep within the earth. In the 1600s, as Western cultures were beginning to come out of the Dark Ages, where science and free thought was frowned upon by the Catholic Church, many scientists and philosophers murdered by the Church's heretics, there were prominent and influential figures who had come to their own conclusions about the earth and if it was hollow or not. It should also perhaps be noted that although these thinkers were no longer forced to operate in secrecy under the threat of death, they were still kept a very close eye on by society's elites. Edmund Halley, perhaps best known for his discovery of Halley's Comet, was just one who theorized that the Earth was indeed hollow during this time. Using much of Isaac Newton's work on gravity to prove his theories, he claimed that the Earth was hollow and had a shell around 500 miles thick, had an innermost core, and was capable of supporting life. He went on to state that an atmosphere filled the space inside the Earth, and that the outer shell and the inner core both had their own magnetic poles that caused them to rotate at different speeds. Leonid Euler, a Swiss physicist, also proposed that the Earth was hollow during his time in the 1700s. Like Halley, he claimed that the Earth had a very thick outer shell, but at its core was a central sun. The sun, he claimed, provided heat and light for the inhabitants of the inner Earth. Interestingly, Euler went on to claim that the inner Earth could be accessed through huge entrances, both at the North and South Poles. It's claimed by some people today that such applications as Google Earth have purposely attempted to hide these entrances, although there are some photographs that appear to show the opening that Euler claimed. As recently as the 1940s, there have been claims of an inhabited inner world, perhaps none more high profile than those made by Admiral Richard Byrd following Operation High Jump in 1947. Operation High Jump was a multinational effort led by the United States to establish a base at the North Pole. On the 19th of February 1947, Admiral Boyd led a squadron of planes over the North Pole. He claimed that he could see vegetation and animals that shouldn't have been there, and ultimately that he saw a huge opening that led inside the Earth. 
However, perhaps even stranger, Bird stated that out of nowhere there were strange flying crafts that got so close to them that they could see what looked like very similar to swastika markings on them. His airplane would not respond and he was essentially in an invisible vice grip of some kind. Bird went on to say that he was taken inside the Earth where he noticed great lakes and vegetation and that the inner Earth had an inner sun. He was greeted by the beings that resided there. They were, he claimed, concerned about humans in general, but particularly about nuclear weapons that were building up around the planet. Interestingly, there have been numerous UFO sightings in and around both nuclear power plants and on grounds where nuclear weapons are housed. It may be worth noting that there have been long rumors that Hitler himself had a keen interest in establishing a base at the North Pole, with the objective being to find the entrance to the inner world, believing that extraterrestrials or an advanced race would be found there. On the 5th of May 1947, the El Mercurio newspaper of Santiago, Chile, appeared with the headline article on board the Mount Olympus on the high seas in which it quoted Byrd saying, Admiral Byrd declared today that it was imperative for the United States to initiate immediate defense measures against hostile regions. Furthermore, Byrd stated that he didn't want to frighten anyone unduly, but it was a bit of reality that in the case of a new war, the continental United States would be attacked by flying objects which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Like Euler 200 years earlier, he also claimed that there were huge entrances to the inner Earth at both the North and South Poles. He repeated these views several times, including at a press conference in front of the world's media, before he was hospitalized and ultimately forbidden from holding press conferences on the subject again. Burr died in his sleep in 1957, maybe predictably, maybe not, there were quiet claims of foul play, although his official cause of death was a heart ailment. Perhaps also worth checking out is Bird's son, Richard Bird Jr., who was six years old in 1947 and had accompanied and witnessed his father's claims. He was found dead mysteriously in a New York warehouse and had, by all accounts, had various trying times during his life. Perhaps the most interesting of all the Hollow Earth claims are those made by the Native American Hopi tribe, who have lived upon the plains of northern Arizona for thousands of years. According to their ancient writings, it was here that their gods instructed them to settle and build up villages in the rock, which look very similar to modern apartment blocks. Here, they were taught to grow corn, beans and squash, and thrived as a civilization. Key to the Hopi's existence was the ant people, who had guided their tribe safely during two cataclysmic events. In the first world, which was destroyed by fire, and the second world, which was destroyed by ice, the tribe had each time been guided by a strange cloud during the day and a moving star during the night until they came to the god-named Satu Knang, who in turn led the Hopi to the ant people. The ant people had lived on Earth since the first time and now housed themselves deep within the planet. They offered the Hopi safety until it was safe to return to the surface of the Earth and also taught them skills such as food storage, rationing and how to sprout beans inside the cavern under the ground. Not only is this another reference to the Hollow Earth theory, but it also lends a certain amount of support to the ancient astronaut theory and the Anunnaki. The Hopi word for ant is Anu. Anu was a Babylonian sky god, the Anunnaki. Not only this, but Naki in Hopi means friend. Ant friend, Anunnaki. Coincidence? For evidence, we should perhaps stress that not everyone agrees with that interpretation. The satellite has revealed the tectonic underworld below the frozen southernmost continent. Researchers have created incredible 3D maps of Antarctica's tectonic underworld and found that the ice has been concealing the remains of an ancient supercontinent's spectacular destruction. It's well known to scientists that the exact geological makeup of Antarctica's innermost land, located in East Antarctica, is yet to be discovered. 
What else awaits discovery in this mysterious continent? Antarctica today is divided into three distinct regions, East Antarctica, West Antarctica, and the Antarctic Peninsula, with each area containing a different topography beneath. The ice of the Antarctic Peninsula, for example, conceals a spine of mountains projecting northwest from the inside of the continent. East Antarctica, the largest area, includes flat plains as well as mountains. The Gambertsev mountain range is located here. Its mountains extend for 750 miles, with peaks rising above 11,200 feet, roughly the same height as the European Alps. This range is completely covered by over 2,000 feet of ice. The ground in West Antarctica is almost completely below sea level. The ocean bowl beneath this section was created during the last ice age, when the weight of the ice, which was considerably thicker at the time, pushed down on the bedrock. But what else lies beneath the ice on this enigmatic continent? In November 2018, news outlets around the world reported that incredible data about Antarctica had been obtained from a defunct European satellite. Launched on March 17, 2009, the Gravity Field and Steady State Ocean Circulation Explorer, the GOCE, was the first satellite of the Living Planet Program, which is the European Space Agency's Earth Science Program. It orbited Earth between March 2009 and November 2013, and its task was to measure the pull of the Earth's gravity more precisely than any mission before. Using data from that satellite, the researchers from Kiel University in Germany and the British Antarctic Survey examined Antarctica under the ice. Analysis revealed rocky zones known as cratons in the Earth's lithosphere, a zone between the planet's crust and mantle. Cratons are the core regions of most tectonic plates. The team also found Oregons, which are folded up regions of plates that are the precursors to mountain ranges. It's by studying the number of cratons and origins that scientists are able to compare the continental plates beneath Antarctica with other regions around the world. GOCE's newly discovered cratons are believed by scientists to represent the remains of ancient continents, and they reveal important information about how Earth's modern-day continents are structured, especially Antarctica. But data from the decommissioned satellite not only produced a global gravity map, but also revealed local gravity changes with a resolution as small as around 50 miles. Co-author of the study, Fausto Ferrocacoli, science leader of geology and geophysics at the British Antarctic Survey said, these gravity images are revolutionizing our ability to study the least understood continent on Earth, Antarctica. In East Antarctica, we see an exciting mosaic of geological features that reveal fundamental similarities and differences between the crust beneath Antarctica and other continents it was joined to until 160 million years ago. One interesting piece of information the team found was that East Antarctica is made up of old Cratons and younger Oregons. The researchers found similar structures to this in Australia and India. However, West Antarctica has a thinner and more homogeneous crust, which more closely resembles the southern tip of South America. The gravity map the team assembled from the data reveals that East Antarctica is made up of multiple cratons, which are the cores of long-lost continents. The scientists use data from other satellites to essentially strip Antarctica of its vast layers of ice so that they were able to focus on the bedrock beneath. When they examined this layer, the team found evidence of the continent's history as part of Gondwana, a supercontinent made of the modern Southern Hemisphere continents. The matching shapes of the coastlines of Western Africa and Eastern South America were first officially noted by Francis Bacon in 1620, at a time when Africa and the New World first became available to study. But the idea that not all the continents of the Southern Hemisphere were once joined in one great supercontinent was not put forward in detail until hundreds of years later. In 1912, by German meteorologist and pioneer of polar research, Alfred Wegener. He's remembered today as the originator of continental drift theory, which he put forward in 1912, suggesting that the continents are slowly drifting around the Earth. 
But Wegener also convinced that all of the Earth's continents were once part of a single great landmass, which he called Pangaea. Its name is derived from the Greek Pangaea, meaning all the Earth. Wegener proposed that Pangaea existed about 240 million years ago, but by about 200 million years ago, it began breaking up. Over millions of years, Pangaea eventually separated into pieces that gradually moved away from one another. These pieces slowly formed the continents we recognize today. Nowadays, scientists believe that several supercontinents like Pangaea have formed and broken up over the course of the Earth's history. These include Panotia, which formed about 600 million years ago, and Rodinia, a supercontinent that assembled around 1 billion years ago and broke up 750 to 633 million years ago. In terms of Wegener's Pangaea, Gondwana comprised the southern half of this supercontinent. According to plate tectonic evidence, the supercontinent of Gondwana was assembled by continental collisions in the late Precambrian, about 1 billion to 542 million years ago, and broke up around 180 million years ago. It eventually split into the landmass we know as Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, the Indian subcontinent, Madagascar, and the Arabian Peninsula. Even though the continent existed many millions of years ago, some paranormal researchers have put forward the idea that Gondwana may have been the original model for the lost continent of Atlantis, with the knowledge of existence somehow being passed down through the ages. Gondwana's formed into its final shape about 500 million years ago. By this time, primitive multicellular organisms had evolved as revealed by the rare fossils left from this period, which include segmented worms, frond-like organisms, and round creatures similar to modern jellyfish. It was also a time, the Jurassic period, when dinosaurs still roamed the Earth, and huge areas of Gondwana were covered with lush rainforest. The first stage of the breakup of the subcontinent began in the early Jurassic period, about 180 million years ago. This new information contained in this gravity map gives scientists more knowledge about how the Antarctic continent was formed. But perhaps just as importantly, it tells scientists what will happen to it in the future. Antarctica is melting at a fairly rapid rate and being aware of its underlying structure can tell us how this will happen and perhaps how it will eventually recover. In December 2019, it was revealed that a new map of the mountains, valleys and canyons concealed beneath Antarctica's ice had revealed the deepest land on Earth and would help predict future ice loss. The new NASA map called Bed Machine Antarctica collects together ice movement measurements, seismic measurements, radar and other data points to assemble what is hoped to be the most detailed picture ever of Antarctica's hidden features. According to NASA's website, Bed Machine is a new Antarctic bed topography product based on ice thickness data from 19 different research institutes dating back to 1967, encompassing nearly a million line miles of radar soundings. Bed Machine relies on the fundamental physics-based method of mass conservation to estimate what lies beneath the radar sounding lines, utilizing highly detailed information on ice flow motion from satellite data that dictates how ice moves. Originally, NASA's bed map was a result of work led by the British Antarctic Survey, where researchers assembled decades' worth of geophysical measurements. In operation from 2013, Bedmap 2, like the original Bedmap, was a collection of three data sets, surface elevation, ice thickness, and bedrock topography. One important discovery made by Bed Machine Antarctica was of previously unknown topographical features, such as the broad ridges that shield the glaciers flowing across the Transarctic Mountains, which separate East and West Antarctica. Bed Machine also discovered the world's deepest land canyon below Denman Glacier in East Antarctica, an astonishing 11,000 feet below sea level. As a comparison, the lowest exposed region of land on the Earth is the Dead Sea, which sits a mere 1,419 feet below sea level. 
The new NASA map is a vital resource that will help scientists predict exactly which areas of Antarctica are at highest risk of sliding into the ocean in the next few decades or even centuries, and which parts might in fact be more stable than previously thought. Who knows what else such Antarctica mapping projects might turn up in the future. The terrestrial presence there, one that various governments of the world may even be aware of. Maybe the best place to start would be a brief recall of the claims surrounding Operation High Jump, a United States-led operation which took place in early 1947 as they looked to establish a research base at the South Pole, at least officially. According to some research, following the transplantation of German engineers and scientists to the United States as part of Operation Paperclip in the aftermath of the Second World War, they had learned of an already established base of the Third Reich in the frozen world of Antarctica, a base, incidentally, that also had an alien presence. With an apparent cover story of wishing to establish a research base in place, the operation was led by highly respected naval officer Rear Admiral Richard Byrd. And it would be Byrd's own writings and testimony that would seemingly reveal the real reasons for the mission. On the afternoon of February the 19th, 1947, Byrd took to the skies for a reconnaissance flight over the frozen continent. However, according to his diary notes, flight entries and press conferences he would give in the days and weeks following the flight, instead of seeing thick, rugged sheets of ice, he found himself looking down on lush, green vegetation, as well as mammoth-like beasts and other animals that he claimed shouldn't have been there. He would elaborate that he found himself looking at a huge opening, and that when he followed it, he found himself inside the Earth itself. It appeared he was flying over a huge city as he entered a mammoth cavernous opening. Then, things turned even stranger. Bird claimed that something took over his plane, while at the same time, a voice came over the radio, bidding him welcome. It had, he recalled, a strong Nordic or German accent. He further noticed several round, circular-shaped objects approaching him. His plane was brought to land on the ground, and several tall, blonde-haired men approached his plane. His last flight note declared that a voice from outside his plane was ordering him to open the cargo doors. According to what he would later tell the Chilean newspaper El Mercurio, he and his men were accompanied to a large building where they were served drinks unlike anything they had previously tasted. He then claimed to have met with representatives of a race that resided in the inner earth. They told him that they had been allowed to enter unharmed as they were aware of his noble character. He would further reveal that the atomic bombs dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima had created concern among their kind regarding the human race, and that they now felt compelled to intervene should such an event appear likely in the future. Perhaps most alarming of all, particularly in light of his statement that the inner race felt compelled to intervene in human affairs, was his claim that the United States military had to prepare for attack from objects that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Whether we should take Bird at his word or treat his claims with a pinch of salt remains open to debate. It is perhaps interesting, though, that he was hospitalized only days after his press conference, and what's more, despite his renowned reputation, he was never again allowed to speak publicly about his experiences again, at least in an official capacity. In his writings around a decade later, Bird would write that he had been ordered to remain silent on his encounter for the sake of humanity. While the claims of Richard Bird were one of the first mysterious events surrounding Antarctica, one of the most recent is no less mysterious or thought-provoking. It occurred at some point in the late 1990s or early 2000s, deep below the Russian research facility Vostok Station. It had long been suspected by scientists that a great lake of water flowed below the ice since the base had been first established in 1957. The presence of the vast lake under the sheets of ice was finally confirmed in 1993 after three decades of tests and experiments by both Russian and British scientists. What is further interesting about Lake Vostok is that scientists believe its environment is very similar to that on Europa, one of the main moons of Jupiter, 
and a celestial body that many believe could well harbor life. And it didn't take long for the scientists with an interest in studying Europa to turn their attention to the lake under Vostok Station. It also didn't take long for conspiracies and alleged leaked documents to find their way into the public domain. The general thrust of the claims are that a secret and ultra-specialized elevator was painstakingly installed through the thick ice and eventually down to the environment below, including Lake Vostok. What's more, according to a whistleblower testimony from someone who claims to have worked on the project, Dr. Anton Padalka, who had sought sanctuary in Switzerland after allegedly abandoning the operation, they found a lot more than they were expecting. Padalka claims the team discovered a 14-armed octopus in the waters of Lake Vostok. This octopus was unlike anything they'd previously seen, with the glass octopus being the closest comparison. According to Padalka, not only did this being seem to have superior intelligence to a standard octopus, it could paralyze a person with its venom from 150 feet away. Even more remarkable, it had the ability to change its form and mimic a number of other aquatic creatures. By the time the research team had realized it could also assume the form of a person and mimic the crew, it was too late to save one of the biologists from being ripped to pieces by this apparent alien life form. It was eventually captured, whereupon Russian military officers arrived at the base and confiscated it. Its whereabouts now is unknown, but rumblings among the crew were that these would be attempts to weaponize the alien DNA of the unsettling aquatic alien, which would ultimately lead Padelka to publicly reveal what he knew. There have, of course, been further claims of bizarre and suspicious goings on over Antarctica as the 2000s have unfolded. Many people have claimed to have spotted anomalous facilities and even crashed UFOs using Google Earth, for example. And while some of these are more convincing than others, they are all intriguing. Without a doubt, one of the most thought-provoking and unsettling claims of unusual activity involving potentially alien bases in Antarctica actually made the pages of the tabloids in 2016 following the claims of archaeologist Jonathan Gray. Gray would state that he had in his possession video footage filmed in Antarctica by an American television crew from California who had been missing since 2002, a short time after the footage had been recorded. Gray put forward that video showed spectacular ruins of the frozen continent as well as an intense American military presence. What's more, this unit themselves appeared to be engaging in archaeological activity at the site of the ruins. For their part, the military in the region denied any such activity or knowledge of the missing television crew. Gray, however, insisted there was a massive archaeological dig, taking approximately two miles beneath the icy surface. And more importantly, the United States authorities were using every power they could to block the airing of the video as it would clearly show this. What does this mean for the claims of Richard Byrd? Was his revelation more accurate and authentic than many people give him credit for? And has the human presence in Antarctica since the end of the Second World War not been one of purely scientific research, but one of using research as a shield to protect the few praying eyes that are in this part of the world from witnessing discoveries and revelations that would not only change human history, but possibly alter our own collective future? And above all else, just what are the ruins of these great cities? Who live there and when? Might we find one day that beneath the icy blanket these cities are the ruins of Atlantis? Might the disaster that overtook the legendary civilization have been part of a pole shift that sent the continent suddenly hurtling across the Atlantic to the southern regions? Might the presence of this advanced alien civilization, Atlantean or not, explained the alleged pyramid of the enigmatic continent that resides near the United Kingdom-owned Princess Elizabeth Station. All of this is speculation, of that there is no doubt, but speculation that is surely warranted for such a mysterious, protected, and off-limits to most location, and speculation that will continue for the foreseeable future or until the secrets of the seventh continent are revealed to all.